Napoleon arrived in Paris. The Duke was summoned to the Tuileries, where he presented himself on the evening of the 20th of March. The circle is numerous, and the Duke had an opportunity of seeing that the invitation he had received was anything but exclusive. What then was to ensue? What reception was to be given to the Duke de Rivigo? If he were one of the conspirators, if he prepared or facilitated the return from Elva, it might be naturally expected that he would receive the reward of his services. If he did not obtain an accession of power and credit, he would not, at least on Napoleon's return, be appointed to a post inferior to that which he filled on his departure. However, the Duke was not recalled to the ministry, and it was not until the second interview that Napoleon said to his former minister of police, I have appointed you, Inspector General of the Gendarmerie. Far from eagerly accepting this favor, the Duke hesitated for several days. He even tendered his resignation. He ultimately determined to accept the post only on the consideration that it was not of a hostile character in principle, object being the maintenance of order and the safety of persons and property. Finally, he accepted it only in the hope of doing good. And he quitted it with the consciousness of having done so, having performed a multitude of private services. Thus, on his return to Paris, the Duke has been rewarded by the kind interest evinced in his favor by men of all classes and all opinions. I pass rapidly over the Hundred Days. The Battle of Waterloo was lost, and General Severi went on board the Bellerophon. He thought himself only a prisoner of war, but he was made a prisoner of state. He was separated from Napoleon, taken to Malta, and imprisoned in a fortress. Meanwhile, his enemies were busy against him. A list was made out. The Duke was inscribed on it, though, notwithstanding the malignity of his enemies. Even his accusers were of opinion that his name ought not to be set down till the very last. The Duke wishes to remain ignorant of the individuals whom he has to thank for his prescription, and he should the fact ever come to his knowledge, he will bury it in oblivion. However, I will merely observe that on the 24th of July, 1815, no charge existed against him for, by the report made to the court-martial, when the sentence for contumacy was pronounced. It is proved that the letter without date, address, or authenticity, which subsequently became so fatal a weapon in the hands of the Duke's enemies, was not discovered, produced, or created until the end of August 1816, the Duke entertained so perfect a conviction of his own innocence that during his captivity at Malta, which lasted until April 1816, he constantly entreated that he might be conveyed back to France and tried conformably with the law so he could not believe what was frequently told him by the officer commanding his guard that he was better off in Malta than in Paris. He was ignorant of all that was going on in France, and knew not to what degree, under the best of kings, unbridled passion rendered the law subservient to hatred, revenge, and reaction. However, when he learned the death of Marshal Ney, the words of the English officer recurred to his memory, and when in April 1816 he succeeded in effecting his escape from Malta, he embarked in a vessel which was sailing for the archipelago. On the 18th of April, 1816, the Duke arrived at Smyrna. He landed on those shores, once the scene of the glory and the liberty of the Greeks, but now subject to what European pride is pleased to denominate Turkish despotism. There, however, misfortune is respected and the rights of hospitality observed. No sooner had the Duke landed than his thoughts again tended to his family and his country. He wrote to Paris, renewing his solicitations to be brought to trial. The first answer he received pointed out the danger which would attend his return. He wrote to the Duke de Feltra, and the answer he then received was his sentence of death. This unexpected stroke would have determined him to remain quietly at Smyrna, but some sanguinary spirit pursued him even beyond the confines of Europe. Molested by the French diplomacy, he sought and found protection amongst the consuls of foreign nations. He embarked in an Austrian vessel sailing for Chiste, which place he arrived on the 1st of April. 1817, he demanded an asylum in the town of Graz and Styria, was assigned to him as a place of residence. There it must be acknowledged he experienced the noblest hospitality under the protection of the Emperor of Austria, and he gratefully exclaimed, Honor to those governments 
which thus prove by their acts that civilization consists not merely in the progress of the sciences, the arts, and industry, but in the practice of the dearest duties of humanity. From Graz, the duke wrote to the keeper of the seals of France, demanding a trial, but he received no answer. He then wrote to his wife, who, accompanied by her daughter, joined him on the 16th of August, 1817. Neither distance, fatigue, nor ill health intimated this courageous woman. Amidst so many reverses, after two years of misfortune and exile, the Duke at length enjoyed the happiness of embracing his wife and daughter. The Duchess shortly returned to Paris, bearing letters to the different ministers. The Duke, again, urgently solicited permission to return to France to obtain the reversal of his sentence for contumacy. Communications with the Duke received from private individuals and which were found on good authority intimated that there would be a law of amnesty and that it was better to wait and take advantage of it than to submit himself to the uncertain judgment of men. Madness still rages, said one of these letters. The Duke then determined to return to Smyrna on the assurance given him in the name of the French government through the medium of the Austrian legation that he should not be molested. On his second arrival at Smyrna, June 1818, the Duke de Rovigo devoted himself to literary occupation, and for the space of nearly a year, the tranquility of his life was interrupted only by an incident annoying, no doubt, through the imprudence of the person who occasioned it. But the French general, protected by the law of nations, ultimately obtained the respect due to his person and character. This event of which the journals rendered an account. Having given the Duke reason to apprehend new persecutions, he determined to embark on board an English vessel bound for London, where he arrived in June 1819. Whatever might be the policy of the English government, which the Duke had no right to scrutinize, he cannot forbear rendering homage to the noble generosity with which several English families offered him asylum in England. It may be truly said that every citizen's house is a secure place of refuge, an impenetrable stronghold where no agent of authority dares to force an entrance. This admirable system of le legislation elevates man by giving to private individuals the happy power of placing the unfortunate outlaw under the protection of their household gods. The recollection of English hospitality consoles the Duke for the ministerial annoyances of which he was the object during his stay in England. He was given to understand that he must proceed to Hamburg, but weary of so many fluctuations and uncertainties, he resolved to make an end of the unsettled life which he had led for four years. He examined the items of the accusation. He questioned himself in finding nothing that could afford a ground or even an excuse for the sanguinary rigor with which he had been treated. He suddenly formed the determination of returning to France and appealing immediately to the justice of the king. Passports were refused, and he contrived to do without them. He embarked at Dover on the 4th of December, 1819, landed at Ostend, and proceeded to Brussels. There he purchased a carriage and repaired immediately to Paris without being molested on the road and without taking any precaution, save that of avoiding those telegraphic machines, which have proved fatal to more than one accused party. On the 17th of December, he alighted at the hotel under the escort of a young English officer who had kindly undertaken to restore him to his family following the example of his three generous countrymen who four years before had removed from France and saved from the punishment of death the unfortunate man whose name immediately preceded that of the Duke de Rivigo on the list of the 24th of July. The bare mention of this fact shows how much times are changed. If the Duke wished to come to Paris, it was not for the purpose of braving authority. Such an idea seldom enters into the head of an outlaw. But he reflected that if he were arrested or if he surrendered himself prisoner in a frontier town, his family would become alarmed. He would be deprived of their assistance and that of his friends, and perhaps it would be less easy to find an advocate to defend him. In short, he conceived that in Paris, under the very eyes of the government, where the law was more active, powerful, and better regulated than elsewhere, he might, without delay, obtain that justice to which he confidently trusted his life and his destiny. How much reason had he to congratulate himself, gentlemen? on having adopted this determination when his sovereign pointed out the tribunal before which he was to be arraigned and nominated as his judges, his old companions in arms, distinguished no less by the firmness of their principles than for their courage. It has been necessary 
to enter into these details, gentlemen, in order to lay open the conduct of the General Savary before the eyes of his countrymen and all those whom he had reason either to blame or to thank. By the arrival of the Duke, the sentence for contumacy is annulled and effaced. There now remains only an accusation, which is scarcely supported, which indeed cannot be supported, and with respect to which I should deem all discussion superfluous. If the rank of the Duke, the name he bears, and the recollections attached to it, his honor, and that his family did not require that I should annihilate, as I can and will do, every trace of those first impressions which have arisen to his prejudice. After this statement, which excited a high degree of interest among his auditory, Mr. Dupin proceeded to examine the charge. We will analyze this part of his pleading. He began by rendering homage to the impartiality of the reporter. The charge, he said, he reduced to two heads. The Duke is accused first of having carried on criminal communications with the Isle of Elba and of having favored the return of Napoleon. Secondly, of having installed himself in power before the 23rd of March, 1815. The first head is supported by the letter attributed to the Duke de Rivido. But on the other hand, Mr. Dupin denies that the letter was written by the Duke. And on the other hand... If it even were his, he affirms that no charge could be grounded on it. Mr. Dupin, in the first place, examines the question whether the letter is written by the Duke. To be convinced of the contrary, he says it is sufficient to attend to the following circumstances. First, this letter was not produced until the end of August, 1816, and yet the Duke was banished on the 24th of July, 1815. Thus, he was banished in anticipation and in the expectation of proof being brought against him. Second, it is without date or address, so that it cannot be referred to any fixed period or any particular person. Third, how happened this letter to appear on the trial? It is alleged that it was addressed to the Duke of Toronto. It was he, then, who produced it? It can scarcely be supposed, for the letter states that Renew was the medium of communication between the Isle of Elba and us. This last word, therefore, would compromise the Duke of Toronto as much as the Duke de Rivigo. The Duke of Toronto would therefore have suppressed it, if not during the hundred days, at least subsequently when he changed, not his office, but his master and his opinions. He would have suppressed it had it been only in the month of July when he countersigned the ordinance of the 24th. But if the Duke of Toronto did not give up the letter, how came it to be? Introduced on the trial, those who have examined the documents of 1860 must have observed among them the following letter. General Staff of Paris, 1st Military Division, Paris, August 28th, 1816. Sir, I have herewith the honor to transmit to you a letter written and signed by the Duke de Rivigo, Severi, in which he recommends to the Duke of Toronto, to whom the letter is addressed, Dr. Renu as the agent of a correspondence between the Isle of Elba and the usurper's party. The indisputable monument of the guilt of Savary will serve at once to complete your instructions and to enlighten the court respecting the intrigues of the accused. Count Despinois, the general commanding the 1st Military Division. 2 A.M. Fiori, reporter. Mr. Dupin remarked upon the partial tone of this communication, which should have been merely a letter conveying an enclosure but which contains not only an accusation but some degree of a sentence since the writer speaks confidently of the guilt of the accused such as he was the sort of feeling which presided at the trial of the Duke de Rivigo in 1860. But there's one circumstance which still remains unexplained. From whom did Count Despinois receive this letter? Add to this the absence of all recollection on the part of the Duc de Rivigo of having written any such letter, and his conviction of it being a forgery. You will not then be surprised at his refusal to acknowledge it, but it will be said inspectors of handwriting have approved by their evidence that the letter was in the same hand as a piece of writing ex executed for the purpose of comparison by the duke in the presence of the reporter gentlemen the multiplicity of forgeries the difficulty of detecting them with certainty and the numerous errors which have been committed by the most honest men when called upon to pronounce their opinions in such cases have long since caused the verification of handwriting by inspectors to be regarded as wholly conjectural and uncertain in spite of their high sounding scientific phraseology the rigid of the moving agents, the flexibility of the fingers and lower arm, the general aptitude of the body and hand, ETC, ETC, notwithstanding this learned mixture of anatomy and metaphysics. The art of verifying handwriting is vain. 
and of our inspectors, we may truly say what the Romans used to say of their augurs, that it is difficult to conceive how they can look at one another without laughing. Here's some persons in court looked towards the inspectors and laughed. In fact, continued Mr. Dupin, what can be proved by the inspection of handwriting? Not that the document has been written by such or such an individual. On that point, there can be no certainty. They merely bear testimony to the general appearance of the document, of the similarity or dissimilarity of the writing and characters. Thus, an inspector of handwriting who appears to have been weary of giving evidence said about writing a book. Leveille de Boutigny, who published a work on proof by the comparison of writing, speaks of his art in these terms. It is certain that, in the general opinion of the learned, the comparison of handwriting is all a matter of doubt and uncertainty. It can at most only lead to a so so presumption. Now, said Mr. Dupin, open the dictionary of the Academy at the term tilkel so much, and you will find the explanation to be rather bad than good. At what period, I would ask, were inspectors of writing, or as they are termed, écrivain, expert, first employed in an age when justice was administered by feudal lords who could neither read nor write. It was therefore necessary to refer to inspectors, but when knowledge became more diffused and our judges by increased information became capable of deciding such questions for themselves, the art of comparing and verifying handwriting, though preserved by custom, has fallen into discredit. How many examples might be quoted of errors committed in this way, not only by professed inspectors, but by persons called to recognize their own writing? How many merchants, for instance, have been known to pay bills which they had never really signed? The reason is evident. If there were any obvious difference in their writing, there would be no forgery, properly speaking, for the forgery consists only in the imitations of the general, genuine document. <laughs> Now this limitation is sometimes executed to perfection. In such cases, the law trusts not to the evidence of inspectors, but refers the whole to the prudence of the judge. In the present instance, there is only one point to be considered, namely the great similarity between the writing of the letter and the handwriting of the duke. And we must inquire whether the circumstances of the case tend to confirm or destroy the inference, which might at first be deduced from this similarity. I must beg of you to bear in mind all the remarks I have already made on the letter attributed to the Duke. To these, I would add the following first. The letter is a reply. Where then is the one conveying the inquiry? Had the Duke been so imprudent as to grant a recommendation in those terms, he could not have imagined there was any danger in preserving the petition. Secondly, the letter is a recommendation where is the indiv individual recommended? Mr. Renew denies having either solicited or obtained this recommendation. His declaration could not be refuted at the time. And he now comes forward to repeat the statements with which he defended himself. First, the place was suppressed. And he knew to a certainty that it would not be restored. Next, how could the term bearer be applicable to him? He has not quitted Paris since 1811. And while he filled the situation of physician to the prefecture of police, not a single day elapsed when the duties of his office did not require him to affix his signature to the office lists. Thus, the contents of the letter must be false, and the letter itself is false. But who is the author of the forgery? Were it necessary, gentlemen, for the Duke's defense to go to the fountainhead, it would not perhaps be impossible to discover the author. Let it not be forgotten that this letter was not produced until a year after the Duke's prescription and only at the time of his sentence for contumacy in 1816. Well, we may dispense with all comments on this head because it is sufficiently evident that the letter is not written by the Duke and because, even supposing it were, it would prove nothing against him. The letter mentions communications with the Isle of Elba, but all kinds of communications with that island was not prohibited. There was a French post office there for the correspondence with the island. We must therefore inquire whether these communications were innocent or criminal. This point remains for the prosecutor to prove. Yet he not only proves nothing, but he specifies no facts. And the reporters, with that honesty and impartiality, which he has so decidedly manifested in the course of the present trial, admits that he has no document relating to this point. Besides, it is sufficient to examine the conduct of the Duke de Rivigo to be convinced that he had no communication with the Isle of Elba. He was living in retirement in the country, seeing scarcely anyone. He was the object of active and at the same time easy supervision, for he resided on a detached estate. 
on an examination of the police reports which refer to him, it will be seen whether his conduct was suspected. Who would he have employed? His old police agents or his old gendarmes? Was he visited by any one of these? Had the Duke aided the return from Elba, he would, when he was molested in March, have flown to join Napoleon. And he fled precisely in the opposite direction. After the arrival of Napoleon, if the Duke went to see him, it was not until after he had in common with all the distinguished personages of the capital and all the old heads of office an invitation to present himself at the Tuileries. And after all, what favor, what great place did he obtain that could be looked upon as a reward for the services he had rendered to the captive of the Isle of Elba, a post very inferior to that which he had previously occupied? This brings us to an examination of the second head, but with respect to the first, it is certain that the letter is not written by the Duke, and if it were, it is not proved that the communication to which it alludes are of a criminal nature. The first head of the accusation is therefore entirely groundless. Let us then proceed to the second. Did the Duke assume power before the 23rd of March, 1815? Here, Mr. Dupin entered upon a preliminary discussion on the ordinance of the 24th of July, 1815. It is not, he observed, a penal law. It does not define offenses. It does not inflict punishments. It relates only to the sentence. It is an ordinance of the kind formerly denominated lettre excitative de jurisdiction. The terms of the first article are the generals and officers who betrayed the king before the 23rd of March or who attacked France and the government with arms in their hands and those who by violence assume power shall be arrested and arraigned before competent court-martial. Monsieur Dupin next inquired whether the Duke de Rivigo came within the terms of the article. No, said he, the Duke did not betray the king. What is the meaning of the word betray? It may be easily defined before a tribunal composed of French warriors. To betray is to turn against any one a power which has been received from him only for his defense and protection. For instance, a commander betrays when he delivers up to the enemy a town which he has been ordered to defend at the price of his blood. But the Duke de Rivigo had no mission, no place, no authority. He did not therefore turn against the king a power which he had received from the king. Consequently, he has not betrayed the king. Was he a rebel? He would doubtless merit that title if, according to the terms of the ordinance, he had attacked France and the government with arms in his hands. But he is not even accused of this crime. Therefore, I have not to justify him. Did he assume power? Mr. Dupin here remarked that the question was of a complex nature and that the terms of the ordinance required that it should be considered under three different divisions. First, did the Duke assume power? Second, did he assume it by violent means? Third, did he assume it before the 23rd of March, 18? 15. The want of one of these circumstances renders the ordinance inapplicable. It would be more especially so if all three were wanting in the first place. What is meant by assuming power in the sense of Article 1? It is, for example, going at the head of a troop of armed men to take possession of a morality, a prefecture, or an office. But the case is different with respect to those who never sought it and who never have received it as it were, in spite of themselves. Thus, to apply this distinction to the Duke de Vigo, if on the 20th of March he had repaired to the office of the minister of police with a picket of gendarmerie, had he driven away the individual who occupied it in the king's name and resumed his former functions, he would then have come within the purview of the ordinance of the 24th of July. On the morning of the 29th of March, the English and Austrian ambassadors, apparently supposing him to be fully reinstated in his functions because the emperor had slept at Fontainebleau, and was expected in Paris, applied for their passports to the Duc de Rivigo as Minister of the General Police. He replied that he had no official character and referred them to Monsieur Dondre, the king's minister, to whom they were accredited. The clerks of the prefecture, fearing to compromise themselves if they acted on their own responsibility, begged the Duc de Rivigo to give them orders, alleging that the police required to be kept every hour and every moment in a state of uninterrupted activity. The Duke's reply was... Do as if the prefect were absent, dead, or sick. The same argument holds good with regard to the inspection of the gendarmerie. Had the Duc de Rivigo proceeded to the hotel of Marshal Monsi and by violent means taken possession of his offices, he would have been guilty. But his conduct was the very reverse of this. He did not assume power. It was consigned to him. He was nominated by a decree which the war minister enjoined him to obey. Far from readily yielding, the duke resisted. On the 21st, he sent Colonel Lagours to Marshal Monsi, requesting him to retain the post, which he had so honorably filled. 
Next day, 22nd, the Duke himself went to repeat the solicitation in person on the same day, the 22nd. At 9 o'clock, the Duchess, who had that day dined at the Tuileries, presented after dinner her husband's resignation to Napoleon. Was this, I ask, assuming power? Above all, is it assuming power by violent means? But there is another circumstance. It is necessary at all events that the Duke should have assumed the power in question previous to the 22nd of March. However, on an examination of dates, it will be found that this third circumstance is wanting. The decree of nomination of the 20th of March has been mentioned. That decree might have been issued on the 15th, 10th, or the 1st of March. No matter. It is the act of a person nominating. While the question at issue is the act of an individual who's supposed to have accepted the appointment. Now, it was not until the 21st of March that Napoleon said to the Duke, I appoint you, ETC. The Duke did not that day accept the appointment. At 4 o'clock on the 22nd, he was still urging Marshal Monsi to accept the appointment. And at 9 in the evening of the same day, he had given in his resignation. But it will be said he ultimately accepted it. What signifies that? Is it certain at all events? that he did not accept the post before the 22nd of March, as expressed in that ordinance, but after, besides the mere acceptance of an appointment, is not the matter in question. Otherwise, it would be necessary to prosecute all who were in office during the 100 days, and the number would be great indeed, for I know of no place that remained unfulfilled at that period. The assumption of power and its exercise are the points under consideration. Now, it is certain that the Duke de Rivigo exercised no functions at the Hotel Muncie. He only took possession at the Route Cerruti, whether the offices were not removed until the 23rd or 24th. Monsieur Hiver, who was at the head of these offices, has assured you that the Duke could not give his signatures until the 25th. Where are his official acts previously to that period? None can be named. The inspector general being superseded. Other changes ensued in secondary situations. Let those individuals be examined who, at the period alluded to, were dismissed or removed. There is not one who was not so situated before the 25th. On the first trial mentioned, was made of an order of the day drawn up on the 23rd. But besides, that date does not come within terms of the ordinance. It has been proved by the printer's register that the printing of that order of the day was not completed until the 24th. Consequently, it could not be issued until the 25th. It has been stated as a circumstance against General Severi that he had received his pay from the date of the 26th of March, but in reply to this, he himself observed that it was a constant custom in the military service to pay the officers from the day of their appointment and not from the day on which they entered upon their duties. Having thus overthrown all the charges successfully, Mr. Dupin deduced from his arguments the following conclusions. First, that the Duke de Rivigo maintained no criminal correspondence with the Isle of Elba. Second, that he did not assume power, that he did not assume it by violent means, and finally, that he did not assume it before the 23rd of March. Is it not, said Mr. Dupin, with reference to this last circumstance, an established principle that the law should warn before it strikes. A penal law in particular should always precede the offense, but in the case under consideration, the ordinance, which prohibits the assumption of power before the 23rd of March, is dated from the 24th of the July following. What arbitrary proceeding must result from this? The king quitted Leo on the 23rd, and on that very date, heir, his majesty had scarcely overstepped the frontier line while he was yet within sight. An audacious hand might with impunity have pulled down the royal standard and substituted another in its stead. And those who on the preceding day accepted appointments on the shore of Khan, which had then been occupied for two and twenty days, would be found guilty. But why should I dwell on this, said Mr. Dupin in conclusion. You will rise to other considerations. You are not only judges, you are jurymen. All may and must be thrown into the balance of your decision. Deign to listen to me. If it be true that on its first establishment or re-establishment a government can be consolidated only by the acts of rigor, it will at least be admitted that such acts are superfluous and even dangerous when the security of that government is no longer threatened. We will say nothing more of 1816. The public mind which has been so long kept on the wreck now seeks repose. What an extraordinary difference is seen in the fate of men 
who all incurred similar chances and deserved to be all judged alike. That Duke de Rivigo is charged with having recommended Dr. Renew in an affair which, had it really existed, would have principally compromised the doctor, and yet the latter was pronounced to be innocent in 1816. Is then the Duke de Rivigo to be condemned for the same offense in 1819? The Duke is accused of accepting functions consigned to him by the Prince of Ecmule. Here, on the contrary, the Duke de Rivigo has been condemned for obeying. While he, from whom he received the order, is a prince, a peer, and a marshal, and truly worthy of the honors he enjoys. Listen, gentlemen, to the voice of your country, or rather listen to the dictates of your own hearts, to that inspiration which never misleads, and which now enjoins an end of the bloodshed, punishment, revenge, reaction, and enmity. Let union and oblivion be your motto. General, Banish the recollection of your past misfortunes and rely on the justice you will obtain. Seek henceforth in the retirement of domestic life, in the bosom of family by whom you are adored and beloved, and console yourself for all you have suffered in your political career. As for myself, gentlemen, since Providence has ordained that it should be my task to defend the individuals whose names stand first and last on the fatal list, may the unanimous voice which will acquit the one console the means of the other. These Trials have now, I hope, reached their conclusion, and I trust that I shall not again be called upon to lend my professional aid to the brave men who have so long and so gallantly defended their country. After deliberating for three quarters of an hour, the court unanimously pronounced the Duke de Rivigo not guilty, and he was ordered to be immediately liberated. <laughs>